Hey, it's Rob, and welcome back to Axel's Garage. This is part two. I will link part one in the description below, maybe up there in the corner if I can, can remember to do it. Um, but we're back in the IROC here, and we left off, I don't know where we left off. We left off, we had pulled the gauge cluster apart, and um, our fuel gauge was erratic. Our temperature gauge was not always reading correctly. Uh, it would read correctly if the engine tended to overheat. Then it would read. Um, but generally speaking, it would read very low. And uh, every time you cycle the key, it would give you a, a different reading. So um, a lot of people in the forums and, and online said to clean off the the studs on the back of the gauges that they didn't tend to get a little uh, oxidation on them they don't make good contact they also said to to pinch down those little clips that these plug into uh, to make the electrical contact better and we did that and didn't really get a positive result that I was confident with so um, I said let me see you know maybe the, the uh, I'll try to source an, a new set of gauges and and see if that works and I think that's where we left off and also the tack um, had some wackiness where it would stay at like 6500 rpms and then when you started the car it would just pe peg out um and didn't work other than that volt gauge worked oil pressure gauge worked so um we had to stop the video because we didn't have anything to to fix at that point and here we are today so i went on ebay and i was able to source a a new old stock uh, temperature gauge and I don't know if this is a GM gauge or not it could be a new old aftermarket stock uh, but a guy on eBay was selling this I think he had like a looked like a box of 50 of them that came in a in like a bulk pack box and he was selling them off one at a time uh, I believe this one was a little pricey probably around 50 bucks or so by the time I got it to my house shipped and the fuel gauge I was able to get a, uh, a real nice shape used one um and that one was only about 20 bucks maybe 30 shipped to my house and the fuel gauge so i went on ebay and i had to wait for the you know wait for them to come in one of them came real fast one of them was a little slower and then there was the tack issue so i contacted a guy at the cajun tax shop in i believe they're in louisiana and that was a place recommended in the forums a few years ago and i had sent the guy an email a couple of years ago and um, he got back to me and I never really did anything with the car or, or him and so I emailed him back Waited a few days didn't get a response went on the website turned out their email address changed So I emailed him again Waited a couple days. He finally got back to me and said yeah He said um what your tack is doing most chances a new circuit board on the back of the tack will fix it So I ordered the circuit board. I think it was fifty five dollars or so and I'm waiting for that to come in um and we'll do a separate video on that because that seems a little bit more involved. In the meantime, we're going to try to get this uh, this whole thing together. And so I had a week to kill. So what did I do? I, I took the dash pad off and this car never had front. Well, when we had it, it hasn't had front speakers for the radio. And that was annoying my wife. She's the one that drives this most of the time. So we ordered a set of, of speakers that fit. I'll show you them. So we ordered a set of reasonably priced Pioneers, um, and they fit nice in the dash, in the factory spot, and they seem to handle the power of her amp really well. They're wired directly to the amp that's in the back of the car, um, so she'll be happy with that, and we just did that because we had everything apart, and I, all, it was, was, all we had left to take off was the dash pad. So... And I had time to kill because I'm waiting for the parts to come in. So while I was waiting for the parts to come in, um, and we had more time to kill, I said, okay, let's do some uh, lights in the dash because half the dash was out. So what we did in the dash was we replaced all the incandescent bulbs with LEDs. I chose a... You can see them on there. I chose a 65... 100 uh, K color temperature 
And the reason why I chose that 6500K was because uh, 5000, uh, they call like daylight, 5, 5500 daylight, um, 6, they still call them white, but they're sort of, you could tell it's an LED white, and then 6500, it's just a little hinting at blue, and the reason why I chose that is because it sort of helps soften the light, doesn't make it that, that dim yellow where a warm white would be, where a regular incandescent bulb would be kind of like that that yellowy white, it kind of makes it a little bluey white, which kind of softens the harshness of the bright white LED. And that's why I chose a set of 6500 bulbs. Now, I thought I could push them in from the front because they're regular 194 bulbs. However, some of them would push in and some of them, the little button that I'm pushing it into popped out the back of the, of the uh, rear part of the cluster here. So this plastic uh, part of the cluster has one of those um, those plastic, I'm going to call it a motherboard that's got the uh, copper uh, you know, wires going through it where everything makes contact. So the easiest way to do this was to uh, pull this white part out. And to get the white part out, I didn't film it just because it was so tight getting in there. I, there was no, I could barely fit my fat body down under that dash, uh, let alone a camera. So this is held in um, back on this side, right about here next to the bulb that's in this slot, and on this side next to the bulb that's in this slot with uh, there's two studs running into the back and there's a nut on the back side, and it's a 10 millimeter nut, so you gotta fish your way under there. You gotta move some, some components that are down there, the, the, um, the directional uh, relay, the horn relay, um, you unbolt that and you can get it the, the nuts on the back of those studs and there's two 10 millimeter nuts. Once you get those, those nuts hold this white thing in place, which makes it grab the contacts with the be which is behind this little thing here and the, a similar one on that side behind the speedometer. And then this white portion will move forward just a little bit, not all the way forward. All right, let me get the phone, hold on, they hung up. So, it'll move forward just a little bit now, and the only thing holding it in at that point is the speedometer cable, which has like a little metal bailing wire kind of clip over it, and you just pry it up a little bit with a, with a screwdriver, and the speedometer cable pops right off, and you could take this whole thing out completely. That was my wife calling me from inside the house um, by mistake, knowing that I was filming something so then she sent me multiple text messages apologizing for interrupting me not realizing that the text messages continued to interrupt wives anyway once you get that out um there's these little buttons and i i did not film it for whatever reason i don't know what it was but um it's it's really it's easy it's very self-explanatory once you get it out you got these little buttons that that turn into that that plastic motherboard paper kind of thing um a quarter turn so you can put your bulbs in the only thing with leds is they're directional so you you got to put it back in illuminate all the lights see which ones you got to change 180 degrees, then pull it back out, change them 180 degrees, put it back in, get them all lit up. Once you know they're all lit, you're good. You, um, you got your, your high beam or your bright lights. Um, you got to check that one by turning the lights on and off. And you got your directionals, and you got to turn that one by, by putting the key on and turning your directionals. While I was under the dash and had a had a you know wedge my body under there, I took the old mechanical flashers out and I put in um, LED style 552 flashers. Did a regular old school 552s. I did that because I didn't want the LED directionals to sort of play with that. I mean, we have all incandescent bulbs everywhere else in the car. It wasn't necessary, but I was under there anyway. I had them in the garage on the shelf, so, and they're really inexpensive, and I, I threw them in. So now, um, after all this babbling, I'm still waiting on, on gauge stuff. So I said, well, let me try to troubleshoot this instead of just, you know, put. I'm going to put the new gauges in either way, probably, because um, I was pretty confident that, that my old gauges were just old and and effed up over the years. I said, let's let's see what it really is. So I took out a meter 
and I'm going to show you what I did to sort of verify that the circuit had what it's supposed to have and that the gauge was giving a bad reading even though the circuit had what it's supposed to had, have which would condemn the gauge and I think that's why you're all here all right so I got the meter and the phone holder I got it on DC volts and what I did and I am just replaying exactly what I did is I pulled my cigarette lighter out just a little bit enough so I could wedge my ground in between the lighter and the shell because that's the ground for the cigarette lighter and then I took my my key and turn the key on all right so now with the key on you could see you have I have my check engine light on and I had my fast and seat belt goes on for like three or four seconds and then it goes off on its own um, and that's normal operation I did leave a regular incandescent in the check engine light that's because I think we might have a constant check engine light because when I took the dash apart there was black tape over the check engine light they didn't pull the bulb they just put black tape over it so um, I didn't want an LED in there being a little bright and harsh so now with my negative on ground I have my three little gauges here so there's my temperature gauge is the one all the way on the left right I believe uh, my fuel gauge is up here in the upper middle and then my volt gauge being right here so the volt gauge only has two prongs that that uh that it plugs into and the other ones have and where is my volt gauge here it is here and you can see it's got uh, three prongs on the back but only two of them are, are actually active which if you put the gauge in this way the way it goes in it looks like it's going to be like this one and this one or something irrelevant um because there's only two over there and i'm going to show you exactly what we do so now um i'm on positive so if i go um i'm not on positive i grounded and i'm looking for power so if i go to this one I have 2.5 millivolts, which would make that uh, a potentially a ground. If I go to this one, I got 11.89 volts. So that is my ground and my power for my volt gauge. And that's all the volt gauge requires is a power and ground. Now moving over to my fuel gauge, I want to know, I know I got a power coming in. So I want to find out which one is the power. And here I got battery voltage, 11.65. The battery is a little low because we've been in and out of the car and ignition on, ignition off, and haven't started it in, in a few days. Um, but we've been drawing power. So I know where my power is. And the other one, I got 2.5 millivolts. And on this one, I got 3.7 millivolts. So my 2.5 millivolts is probably going to be my ground, and my 3.7 is going to be um, one of my readouts for the gauge. And then if we move down to the temperature gauge, and I could be wrong on that ground and, and things, I just know that these are both millivolts and a little amount of millivolts, you know, three and two millivolts. So now moving to the temperature gauge. There's my battery voltage one, and then my other two, again, are 2.5 millivolts and 4.3 millivolts. So, again, I think my 2.5 millivolts is going to be my ground. I'm not an expert at all in, in this electrical stuff, but what I do know is that now that I've identified those two circuits, I can go to ohms. Okay, and... What I want is, I want to know how many ohms is on my, the two, those two millivolt voltages coming out of my temperature gauge. And, right, I'm getting this ohm reading here. Um, all right, three point. 3.32 now I don't know whether that's kilo ohms I don't know whether it's 332 ohms and the decimals in the wrong spot because I don't know anything about that stuff so what I did was I did a little googling so like I said I don't know whether this is milli ohms kilo ohms regular ohms I just know it's 3.322 or it could be 332 or 33.2 so I googled around until I found a chart and I'll put a picture of that chart in right here. 
So now that chart shows the approximate, and this is an approximation, temperature in Celsius and Fahrenheit and how many ohms it should be putting out. So this engine is cold, but it's, you know, it's September now. Oh, wow, it's September. So, you know, what's the temperature of the engine and how many ohms should it be is where we're looking at here. So, um, it's 80 degrees today. So let's look at the temperature and we got 100 and we got a 70 on the temperature chart. And I did get this from uh, thirdgen.org is where I found this. So between, I don't know if this is gonna focus on the camera or not, but uh, at 70 degrees, it should be 3,400 ohms. So I'm at 3,320. And it's, you know, like I said, it's it's 80 degrees out or so, and the engine hasn't been started, and I'm at 3,320. And what I did do was I started it up, and I watched what this was doing with it plugged in like that. And as the temperature of the engine, as the engine warmed up, this number went down, and it stabilized at right around the 135 to 140, which is between 210 and 220, and that's where it stabilized. So I knew my circuit was reading pretty good, and then I turned it off, let the engine cool down, and just sat here watching. And as the engine cooled down, this number got higher and higher and higher. So I knew this circuit is good, and I was pretty certain that it was gonna be the gauge that was gonna be the problem, so I was happy that I wanted a gauge. Then I did the same thing over here on the fuel gauge, and the fuel gauge in most of the GM cars since the, the late 60s to into the at least the 80s, um, the fuel gauge was, was a simple uh, like two wire, uh, you know, two wire kind of uh, kind of gauge. And now what I want to do here is I want to figure out if my fuel gauge is reading correctly so um, going back to the ohms here and I know that I got I think I parked this for the winter at a little more than half so the the fuel gauge for these vehicles is zero is empty and 90 is full ohm wise so the, as the the fuel goes down so does the resistance and when it gets to zero you're empty and when it's at 90 you're full and i'm at 60.8 which is more than half a 90 so um almost coming up on three quarters uh, of a tank but i'm pretty happy with that reading also because i think that puts me in the ballpark as well so i think we're in pretty good shape for getting the gauges so